Hello, guys. Welcome back to the Mike Pincus Fitness Podcast. We are here this week with an interview. And I'm not even going to say it's an interesting one because they're all interesting. Uh, but we are interviewing a family member of the podcast. And uh, Caleb, by the way, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Guevara. That would be way better for him to say than me. <laughs> Guevara. Guevara, yes. Caleb Guevara is a physical therapist out of Camarillo, California area. And Caleb is Jonathan's uncle, although they look identical. Um, and Jonathan and Michelle, as you guys know, helped me with my podcast. It was Jonathan's idea to do this thing. And Michelle got suckered into it. And you guys know the whole story. If you haven't heard it, go back. It's a great story. And so in all the time I've been talking about the connection with physical therapy and chiropractic and medical doctors and uh, personal training, and as far as the angle that I like to take on, uh, Jonathan had said, hey, would you like to talk to my uncle who's a physical therapist? I'm like, hey, that'd be great. So here we are. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with some of the basic stuff to kind of just take you down the road and that we guarantee, well, I, I was going to say I guarantee you're not going to cry, but um, the <laughs> last two actually, now the last one didn't cry, the one before did, but I think you're going to be fine. Um, it's not Barbara Walters. Um, it's pretty dang close though. Uh, where'd you grow up? Um, it's always been an interesting question because uh, I was born in New York City. Okay. Um when I was four, my parents decided to move to Puerto Rico. So I moved there when I was four. Are they from Puerto Rico? They're from Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, my dad wanted to have his own farm. So after living in New York for 20 years, he decided to move to Puerto Rico. Wow. I thought he was moving to Puerto Rico to get away from the snow and cold, but actually he just wanted to have his own farm. Oh. So. Wait, couldn't he have had a farm in New York? Not in the up- city, obviously. Up- upstate. Yeah, upstate. Yeah. Freezing. Um, <laughs> but he wanted to grow plantains, so okay. they, they grow better in the tropics. Sure. So, so we moved to Puerto Rico, um, lived there for 10 years, and uh, farmer. So, of course, you know, things are not predictable. Um, so they got behind on their finances. So um, they talked to an uncle that lived in Massachusetts. He said, hey, you should move here. Um, there's money in the gutters. There's, you can have two, three jobs if you want to. Wow. So they painted this beautiful picture. <laughs> so my family, without thinking about we were in school, our future, just picked Just up. went. So he couldn't leave the farm alone, so he moved with my mom to establish us, and then he was going to go back to Puerto Rico. Okay. So in, in 1984, we moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. Okay. And so I was in 10th grade. All right. So Ooh, rough time. I know, rough time. To leave. Is your is high school in Puerto Rico the same for the most part, nine through twelve out yes, here? Okay. It's the same same system. Yeah. So going into tenth grade you moved? Or at the end of tenth? Uh August. So it was at the beginning. Yeah. Wow. So new school. Yep. Uh, new language. Yep. And I was concerned. Because of my grades, you know, if you want to go to college, you want to make sure that your right. grades in high school. Right. Um, so, so that was rough. So, tenth grade, one high school. Eleventh grade, a different high school. And then, that high school in eleventh grade, they closed and they built a brand new high school. Oh my god! They combined gosh. two high schools. So my <laughs> senior year was a brand. We were the first graduating class from that high school. Wow. So uh, my mom, she was a nurse's aide. Uh, my dad was a farmer, and my sister, my older sister, Jonathan's mom, always talked about being a nurse. And my older brother always talked about being a pharmacist or a chemist. Mm-hmm. So kind of in the medical field, and I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field. Um, and at the time, the only options I knew were nursing and medical school. So I didn't want to be a nurse. I, didn't want, I thought I didn't want to be wiping butts and... <laughs> <laughs> and then good choice and then medical school which now I I think was one of my biggest mistakes I used time um, as a way of deciding if that was going to be my profession because I know it's going to take me 12 years to become a doctor so that's a long time right instead of thinking well 
okay, it's going to take me 12 years, but at the end of the 12 years, I'm going to be a doctor. doctor. Right. If I go the uh, another route, uh, 12 years later, I'm going to be something else, <laughs> not a doctor. Right. That's a good way to look at it. So, um, so my decided to go to college in Michigan. Um, they didn't know California was an option. They didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. Yeah. Um, so went to. A you went from cold to colder. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm originally from Chicago, so I know the weather in Michigan. Yeah. So then I wanted to study something in the medical field, but I didn't know what. So um, my freshman year, I was kind of undecided. My, my roommate, he was a medical technology major, and my sweet mate was a physical therapy major. Hmm. Um, so after talking to my roommate, I said, ah, that sounds interesting. So I, I, I signed, signed on to be a uh, medical te- technologist. And another mistake they didn't. I just read about it. They didn't actually spoke to a medical te- technologist to see what they did. Um, at the end of that f- first semester, we had a class trip to a local hospital, mm-hmm. and we found out that the uh, the medical technologist they worked in the basement. There were no windows. Oh my gosh! And <laughs> all they did, they took you know blood samples. They put right. them in a machine. They sucked the blood, and the printout came out. And I said, I don't see myself doing this for no the rest of my life. No way. So it was kind of a crisis. So then I, talking to my, my sweet mate, who was a physical therapist major, uh, asked him about the profession, what they did. And, and what he told me, he's like, wow, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I didn't even know it existed. Wow. And at that moment, my whole life had purpose. Yep. Very and cool. And so I was like focused. Yep. Okay, this is what I want to do. Did you play any sports as a kid? Um, in Puerto Rico, being a growing up in a farm, um, farming was a sport. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys cow tip? No, we had cattle, but no, that they don't do. They don't tip in Puerto Rico uh, for some reason. I don't know. What yeah, to, they're probably a little more. Um, um, what's the word? Um, I completely blanked out there, but um, proper. Because in the Midwest, we cow tipped. Um, yeah, it was late at night, full speed, forearms up, two or three of us hit the cow, cow goes over, and you pray you don't get chased. Huh. Yeah, it's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I would, I would go tofu tipping oh, instead tofu. of uh, cow tipping. Yeah. Um, all right, when you got into uh, high school, did you play any sports? So I... Uh... So growing up in, in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, don't, they don't have uh, after-school sports. Okay. If really? Want, yeah. So if you want to play a sport, you usually have to join a city league if you want to play baseball. Okay. Um, college has track. Okay. But in high school, there's no... Nothing. There's no wow. sports. So are they... So like, for instance, baseball, because it, it's very big in Puerto Rico, are, are they essentially in like a club league? Mm-hmm. Is that Everyone what it is? is okay. Club wow. So I was fit from working in the farm. Yeah, yeah. Um, they didn't know I was fit <laughs> until um, when I went my f- first week at the school, at the high school in Massachusetts uh, for PE. They had us run around the block. Mm-hmm. So I ran and I came in first. And so the, one of the guys said, you need to talk to my coach. And said, uh, we, need a, we need you in our cross-country team. Cross country was cross country. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to run across the country? Like, <laughs> nah, not happening. So, so I joined the cross country team. Okay. Um, so I did cross country, um, junior and senior year, and as well as track. Wow, so. it's interesting because your Jonathan, your dad, if I remember correctly, was like a runner and didn't realize how fast he was. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Jonathan's not that fast. Compared to them, no. 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 But on a bike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, did you, all right, so in cross country, did you ran cross country then? Mm-hmm. Yes. Any injuries? No injuries. No injuries. Because I was going to say that's typically where if you go in the world of physical therapy, chiropractic, you're working on bodies um hands-on like that 
typically it's somebody got an injury and yeah, I kept seeing the physical therapist or I kept seeing the athletic trainer and it's like, okay, I think I want to do that. Yeah. Um, that's usually a lot of physical yeah, therapist first introduction exactly. to Yeah. So it's interesting. Therapy. You yeah. never even experienced that. Um, which this can also go back to a theory that I have. So your strength um, as a kid growing up came from the world of farming. And in high school, all right, so up until high school, the I'm going to say that the uh, average athlete is not, that's not doing farming, is not lifting any weights, okay? They're not doing a whole lot of conditioning. Maybe if they're in the world of a club, maybe club soccer, maybe they're doing some conditioning. But for the most part, up until freshman year, they're really not doing any formal strength training. Then they get into high school and they start doing formal strength training. Now, my take on it is the up until recently, because a lot of it has changed, but take this back even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 10 years has been changed, but 15 years ago and back, the formal strength training in high school is what I would consider the opposite of functional training, the opposite of something that's going to transfer to the field, the court um, that you're playing on. Um, They're sitting on selectorized machines, getting stronger. They're doing a bench press, getting stronger. They're doing individual movements. And we've kind of talked about this on the podcast. And now you take them and you put them in a field, uh, lacrosse, football, baseball, your world of cross country. And now they're seeing resistance coming in every different direction. And again, just my theory here, but you growing up in a farm and moving your body in every single direction and lifting and moving was probably some of the best conditioning possible for you had you done any sport. And perhaps one of the reasons you did not see any injuries. Um, so, uh, kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was like farming CrossFit. Yeah, know, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, and it's funny because the when you look at um, growing up in Chicago – um, we weren't, we didn't live in the city. We lived in the suburbs. And then for three of those years, I, we moved as a family, um, to the West side of Illinois and it was all farm country. And so I really got to be around kids, uh, eighth, ninth and 10th grade. And I got to see what farming was really all about. Um, detasseling, uh, corn. Oh. Did you ever do that? No. Did you ever detassel? Oh, my gosh, the worst hell you can imagine. <laughs> you literally are on a machine and it's a, it's a, I have no idea what it's called, but it's a big John Deere machine and there's baskets and there's rails across and you're standing and you literally are at the machines moving and you're pulling the tops of the corn off as it's going. And you seem like, okay, that's not that big of a deal. You try doing that for eight hours and then the mosquitoes come out and it's humid and then like a bone brain, I take my shirt off because it's hot out and your skin's exposed. And now they're just eating you alive and you can't swat at them because you're going to miss a detassel. And if they get to the end and they, you missed anything, you had to get off the machine and run and grab it. I'm five foot two at the time, not now. <laughs> and you're sitting here and you can't, if you bend it and break it, the corn stuck, you get yelled at and you bend enough of them, you get fired. The first shift is four hours, lunch, four hours. I never went back to the second shift, never did that ever again. (laughs) I quit. (laughs) It was not good. But I got to see what, again, then I had no idea what I was looking at and what I was witnessing. But now I know watching my friends grow up on the farm, getting up early, uh, moving the hay bales around, um, just even milking the cows and grabbing that, the gallon, you know, big gallons of milk or whatever it was. I mean, it's a farmer carry. I mean, now we do it with perfect form with kettlebells. And it's like, no, try doing that with milk sloshing Mm -hmm. out and don't spill anything. So you think of all the activities that you would do on a farm, it absolutely transfers to what we're now doing in training people. And I think that's the problem with kids today. And I see that in the clinic when they come in, you know, they... 
they're introduced to a sport, either soccer, football, and they're behind physically, uh, strength-wise, because you know they at home they don't do any mm-hmm. hardly any, any chores, they don't do any physical work, right? So they're so behind strength-wise. Yep. And then they are expected to do cer- certain things in sport, cut, jump. Yep. And then that's when they get injured. Yeah, exactly. And and they've never been trained for it. Um, a lot of the coaches didn't even know how to teach it, how to train it. Just, hey, just go do it. I mean, I remember our coach in, we had a PE. We had PE, which everyone had back then, but our, our um, gym teacher was the PE teacher, which was the assistant football coach. And here we're just these little peons that are not playing on his football team. So he would set us up, we'd get there and he's like, okay, you're on bench, you're on da, 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 you're whatever. And he'd grab the newspaper and sit there and read and occasionally flip it over. Like, why are you sitting around? And you're like, you didn't tell us what to do. You didn't, nothing. So we figured this out on our own is amazing. We survived that. Um, so you throw that in and now if you decide to go out and play a sport, well, you had PE, you should be strong and no, get injured. So, um, Okay, so for yourself, at uh, what school in Michigan? I went to a private uh, Christian school, okay. Andrews University okay. in southwest Michigan. All right. Bering Springs. So graduate there with a degree in, is a degree in physical therapy, kinesio? So because it was a private Christian school, it was expensive. and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So... When I decided, okay, physical therapy is what I wanted wanted to do, and I knew what I was required uh, as an undergrad, I decided to uh, move back home okay. to Massachusetts. Got it. So I wanted to be in school full-time, but I didn't have enough credits just for to fulfill my pre-physical therapy requirements. Mm-hmm. So I started looking into athletic training. Okay. So in athletic training, a lot of the classes uh, were the same, and... With a background in, in sports, in athletic training, uh, it, it appealed to me. So I decided to f- um, finish a degree in athletic training. So it took me an, an extra year, but I was able to finish my bachelor's in athletic training while finishing my prereqs for PT. Perfect. So for those listeners and some people hear what um, they hear athletic training, um, and they are, um, but they don't know exactly what's the difference between a athletic training, which is ATC, and a physical therapist. So, an athletic trainer works directly under the supervision of a physician, um, typically for a sports um, facility or a sports team, high school, college. So, athletic trainers they provide um, education, instruction. To prevent injuries, they do also do assessment. They cover uh, games. And they fit athletes for, uh, for the helmets. They, uh, um, the main thing that people think about athletic training is taping. They mm-hmm. do a lot, a lot of the taping in their ankles, uh, hands, for, mm-hmm. especially for football. Um, and during the games, they, they're there too as, as, a, as a first responder. Okay. If someone has a head injury, a fracture, Sprain, they're the first ones on the field. Okay. When you're watching an NFL yep. game and an injury and an athlete goes down, those individuals on the field, those are, those are athletic trainers. Got it. Even there might be a, a doctor on site, the athletic trainer is the one that talks to the, to the athlete. First. First. And foremost. Okay. And they're the one that makes the assessment. And then they um, <clears throat> respond. They, um, then they uh, um, report to the physician. Got it. So extremely important for those uh, that are listening and if you're interested in really delving into the sports world and taking it beyond um, working with athletes as as a personal trainer as I get to work with athletes, but taking that really to the next level, really look into ATC, uh, athletic training. That's so that would be the closest profession when someone thinks or talks about sports medicine, mm-hmm. athletic training it would okay. be the closest you're at. Yep. working directly with the athletes and you're the ones that uh, assess the the athlete when they get injured perfect perfect they're, they're like the physical therapist on the field uh, on the field yep all right so then you decide so you get a atc and then you go to physical therapy school 
then uh, then I applied to PT school and I got accepted in Andrews University in Ohio. Okay, wow, you're bouncing all over. <laughs> so Massachusetts, in, Michigan, Massachusetts, Ohio. Yes. Where in Ohio is it? Uh, Dayton, Dayton, oh, Ohio. Okay. And how long is that school? So the school is three academic years, but two um, calendar years. So oh. at the time when I graduated, uh, the professionals moved into a master's program, master's degree. Okay. So when I graduated, I graduated with a master's degree. But now the professional has moved on to, to a doctorate. doctorate. Right. So that's interesting. Um, so it was just turning into a master's degree when you graduated, you said? Mm-hmm. All right. And then when did you graduate? In 96. And when did it go, everyone getting a doctorate? Um, probably about 10 years ago. Okay. Now, are you required at all to get a doctorate or is it? No. Once you, once you pass the, uh, right. National board exam, as long as you maintain your license. Yep. Um, you don't need a doctorate degree. Got it. Is there any difference in doctorate degree versus master's degree? The the difference now is they do have uh, a bit more schooling. Okay. They probably take three or four more classes that mm-hmm. would they take pharmacology. Okay. Um, imaging. Mm. And um, differential diagnosis diagnosing. Okay. And they do probably five more weeks of uh, clinicals, but the education the anatomy is all it's all, all the same. same. Got it. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, because I remember um, hearing that um, some of the schools were um, going to doctorate. And if I remember correctly, Northridge out here uh, was one of the first ones to go to a doctorate program. I, I believe. I could be totally wrong, but I believe. Yeah, so now nationwide, all it's the... everyone. All the people, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, all right. And then... Um, once you got into, um, well, I don't, I don't know if it was high school or college. When did, or if you did, when did you start working out yourself? Um, formal strength training or cardio or, or did you ever, or are you just genetically freaky? <laughs> <laughs> he sits here at 350 pounds, six, seven, <laughs> 4% body fat. So I'm just really curious how he got this way. Um, I would have to say, uh, so I, after high school, college, um, I, I stay f- active. I, I guess I stayed, I stayed mm-hmm. active, um, with cycling, mainly cycling, some running. Then a friend of mine that lived in Puerto Rico, he, um, uh, he invited me to come down and participate in a triathlon. Mm. Um, it's the oldest triathlon in Puerto Rico. And, uh, since my parents, we're living in Puerto Rico at the time. I hey, that would be a good excuse. Go to Puerto Rico, do this triathlon. You, sure. You use that as, as an excuse to also see my parents. And uh, so he and I, we we had a uh, friendly bet. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna go, might as well have a, a bet. So I I suggested the loser should buy the other a brand new pair of shoes. Okay. But he said no, nah, because he was afraid that he was gonna lose. <laughs> But he should have taken that uh-huh. that bet because uh, you know he's a he's a he was a li- he's a lifeguard. Okay, excellent swimmer. Yeah, um, r- I'm a better runner than he is, and cycling we're about the same. Okay, so I I thought of course I'm gonna win. You know I I thought I was in better shape. Right. Yeah, than he was. So I went to Puerto Rico. The uh, triathlon was in June, first week in June. Did you train for it? I did train. I did train, yeah. um, but not. I should. It was a sprint triathlon. Okay. And this was, what year was this? Uh, 2005. All right. And, uh, and I, even though I grew up in Puerto Rico, now living here, I was not acclimated to the weather, to the heat. Oh, in July, yeah. In July. Oh, wow. So I um, <laughs> went to Puerto Rico. Um, the swim was in the ocean. And, of course, I knew he was going to be ahead of me in the swim. And I was going to play catch up during yeah. the entire. But when I come out of the water, he was uh, probably 
a few minutes ahead of me. Okay. And the heat, the experience, and it was it was my first triathlon. Uh, he beat me by 15 minutes. Oh, which is huge. Yeah, in, in a, a sprint. sprint. Yeah, exactly. So I was, I was very humbled. <laughs> so, so if you would have taken me on that bed, he would have you know, yep. brand new pair of shoes. Exactly. But we ended up just going to a plantain restaurant, okay. and he got a free free meal. <laughs> so then that became a tradition every year. Okay. I would go to Puerto Rico. Yep. And do that triathlon. So that that started my formal training. Got it. Um, so of course, you know, I started training better, started yep. researching, um, reading and talking to other triathletes and what, what right. to do. So swimming was always my, my weakest. Um, so then I, I worked on that. So the second year he beat me by one minute. Wow. So, so now I have a whole year that I, I'm visualizing him right in front of me. I visualized him for a whole year catching him. Yep. So that next year, I worked on my swimming. That was like the main thing that I worked on in my swimming. And of course, running and biking. Yep. So that third year, I was, I was focused. I was determined that this is the year I'm going to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he talks a lot. He's, he's like, he, he knows everyone there. And he's like, telling everyone why I was there. He was going to beat me again. You know, he's, he was already savoring the, the, the new, the meal yep. that I was going to get. And, uh, and I was just looking at him saying, you don't know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. So I, I knew that I knew I was, I was going to stay close to him. And my girlfriend came with me and I, I told her, you know, okay, when I come out, let me know, you know, how much time he's ahead of me. Right. So we start the swim, and when I come out, um, she yells at me, he's 30 seconds ahead. Wow. And, uh, and then I looked up, and I saw him running with the bike. Okay. And at that, t- at that time, I knew I had him. Yep. So um, <laughs> couldn't catch him on the bike. Okay. Um, so we start the run, and I'm behind him, but he doesn't know I'm behind him. I love this. <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> and uh, so it's an out and back run. Okay. And there's a, uh, we have to turn around this, yep. around this cone. And I time my turn so I'm on the outside, on the outside to the right when he makes a turn. So he doesn't see me yep. when we turn. We turn at the same time and I don't say anything. And I'm just staying with him. And I know he's looking for me. Right. He's looking for me. And, you know, a few runners go by, and at that point, I should have been there. Right. But he hears there's someone behind him, and he can hear the steps, because I'm right, I'm like a foot behind him. Um, and so after he realizes that it's me, he just says, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I'm right behind you. <laughs> wow. were, and were you pacing yourself to his pace at that point? Yeah. And I knew, I knew what I had left, so I knew I had... And so, and it was kind of interesting because, uh, this whole year I've been visualizing, you know, this killer, yep. I'm going to, I'm going to humiliate him. I'm going <laughs> to, and then when I got to, and I was running with him and I said, I need to take off because I can run with him. Right. I felt sorry for him. I said, no, it's, no, I said, no, stop no, no. <laughs> exactly. No, Bury got, him. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Crush them. So that's, so, so, I be, so I beat him by one minute. Just one minute. Yes. That was the third year. The third year. Then the second year, I beat him again. Okay. By two minutes. Yep. Nice. And if you are, do, you guys still continue this tradition. So we so we did that for seven seven years. Okay. And uh, then he sustained an injury. He was cutting a tree with a, a chainsaw. Oh wow! And a branch came down and hit his knee. Ooh. So he tore his ACL, partially tore his PCL. Wow. wow. His, That's one way to try to get out of this yeah. uh, competition. So, it, so it's no excuses. No exactly. excuses. No, absolutely not. He he didn't have pity on you. <laughs> I say he still is in. Um. All right. So let's move along here. Um. All right. So graduate PT school, and you're in Ohio. And where do you go from there? So, in Ohio, I I work for Kettering Medical Center, and they um. I think it was the perfect place to work as a, a sports physical therapist. Mm-hmm. 
the hospital had a sports medicine facility, and plus they had the hospital. Mm-hmm. So everyone who had any chronic conditions, uh, low back, neck, they all went to the, to the hospital, and we saw just athletes, which you don't you don't get to right. you don't get to do that. Yeah. Um, so I would say ninety eight percent of my clients were athletes. So we had contracts with uh, the, a lot of the Division One schools. Mm-hmm. Um, we were the uh, we provided the physical therapy for the uh, minor leagues, uh, the Cincinnati Reds minor mm-hmm. leagues team, uh, the professional hockey team in in Dayton. We mm-hmm. provided the rehab for them. Um, so it was a great facility too. We had uh, occupational therapist, speech therapist. Um, we had a, a dance physical therapist uh, treated all the dancers in the area. Perfect. And we had exercise physiologists. We had uh, sports psychologists. Oh, yes, you had every, um, a huge then, facility. And plus, we had a sports acceleration uh, component in our own clinic for healthy athletes that wanted to come in and right. improve their speed, power, strength. Wow. So we can take someone, a patient, take them through rehab, and then once they're ready to move on to the next phase, they would stay there, and then the, the athletic trainers would take over mm-hmm. and continue the uh, the athlete, the uh, you know the strengthening right. part of it. Very cool. Um, so I did that for six years. Okay. And then um, where did you go from there? So um, it was November... 2002 and I was getting ready for another winter <laughs> <laughs> it's always this time of the year <laughs> and and the weather was changing the leaves were gone it was everything was kind of gray and I had just finished I just a relationship I broken up with my girlfriend at the time mm-hmm. and you know when that happens you're ready yep. to yep move on and so I started questioning you know why am I here right why am I putting up with this weather and yep you only live once. Yep. Why am I here in Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with Ohio. For any of you Ohioans, don't yell I at love, us. People are friendly. They're oh, lovely. unbelievable friendly. Yeah. Yes. Mid, that whole Midwest. It's great. However, <laughs> however, there's a reason they're that friendly. I know you can't have <laughs> crappy weather and crappy people. No way. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. Um, real quick, um, the artist Prince, um, artist formerly known as Prince. He lived in Minnesota, I know. and he had a massive um, studio, 50,000 square foot house in Minnesota, and people always ask him, why Minnesota? It's because there's no evil people in Minnesota. Mm. Everyone's so nice. And he literally could go anywhere. Nobody would bug him. Yeah, Midwest, if you've never experienced the Midwest, you do yourself a favor. Pick any city in the Midwest and... Just go walk around. It's beautiful. Do not go in December. Do not go when it's snowing or there's humidity. So there's like two weeks in the fall and two weeks in the spring. Other than that, yeah, it's great. So you're thinking, okay, it's time to go. Time to go. So then I, I okay, if I'm going to move, I'm going to move to where is the best place to live in, in the States. You know, I wanted to look, look for a place mm-hmm. that had great outdoor activities and access to mountains, trails, uh, ocean, you know. Yep. So it came down to between Boulder and Southern California. Wow. So, um, and then I was thinking, well, it's expensive. Yeah. But then I started thinking there are millions of people that live in California. If they can afford to live there, I should be able to. Right. So I decided to move to California. Very good. Did Did you know anyone here? Didn't know anyone. Wow. Um, so uh, I took a traveling, signed on with a traveling company. Okay. Um, a traveling physical therapist with a kind of mm. like traveling nurses. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, if a clinic, someone goes out on maternity leave or right. someone quits and they can hire someone right away, they can contact a traveling company and they have therapists on staff and they say, hey. Oh, that's cool. And they can place you right. in a clinic for 13 weeks, usually 13 weeks. Oh, wow. So that's what I, uh, I did that. I signed up with a company, and then they pay you for your travel expenses to California. They set you up on a uh, furnished apartment. That's amazing. Um, we trainers don't have that. It <laughs> 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 is not available to us. <laughs> that's really cool. So did you go right to Camarillo area? So my first assignment was in Oxnard. Okay. So I didn't know, yeah. didn't know about Oxnard. Never heard about right. Oxnard. 
And so it was a 12 week assignment. Okay. And, uh, when I arrived in, in August, 2002, I cannot believe the weather. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's like perfect. Yeah. There's no humidity, no yeah. clouds. It's and it like, just gets better <laughs> from August on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I asked my, my coworkers, aren't you guys going to go out and do something? And it's perfect. Oh, it's like this all the time. <laughs> it's like, could not believe it. Yeah. And it's crazy, isn't so, it? Yeah. Um, all right. So you're there for, were you there for 12 so weeks? I was there for 12 weeks. And then my next, I was going to move up to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But I, um, the weather was so great, I decided to, to stay. Perfect. Very so, good. So then I, so then I started working for a per diem company. So I just did per diem work. Okay. In Southern California. So every day, sometimes hmm. I go to a different clinic. Yep. And the Ventura County, even LA. So I, in a way, I like that because I, then I get to see how different yep. clinics um, did physical therapy. Right, right. Where, how far south down, how far south did you go? Pasadena. Okay. Pasadena, Burbank. Um, cover um, Van Nuys, uh, Santa Clarita, mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. Beautiful, yeah. yeah. What made you choose Camarillo? So, uh, actually, I work for two companies. I work for one, Two Trees Physical Therapy in Ventura. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of mine um, needed help. She She's a uh, office manager in Camarillo. Okay. And they do aquatic therapy. Oh, so I, okay. So, I do both. I do so, you're both therapy. locations. Yes. Got it. Split pretty equally? Three times in Ventura and two times a week oh, in Camarillo. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah, if you guys ever get a chance to visit that area that he's talking about, Ventura. Well, I know Jonathan and Michelle are there. Uh, it's, a, it's a unique little, I mean, you know what? It's crappy. Don't go see it. You're not, <laughs> not going to like it. It's too close to the water. I mean, we could have a typhoon come in and just wipe it out. So, yeah, you're not going to like it. But, no, reality is it's beautiful. Um, I actually had a client that I trained least five years um, up in the hills of Ventura mm -hmm. and this is when I was building my business still I would drive out to Ventura 35 minutes to him and leave him and then drive all the way to Tarzana oh, wow. and it would take me an hour and I couldn't tell you how many times I was close to falling asleep on the freeway and that was just bad and I did that for well, the whole time I trained him because I trained the Tarzana guy even longer. And it was really, I took on the Ventura one thinking he'll refer me to more and I'll start having two days a week in Ventura, two days or three days a week in TO. Never happened. Never got another client in Ventura. And I finally just said, I can't do this anymore. And he had a beautiful view up on the, up in the hills um, from his backyard. He had complete view of the valley of Ventura and then out to the ocean. It was yeah. just spectacular. Um, but yeah, it's, it's such a neat area and it, it is, it, it literally sits in a pocket. It's on the way from, uh, if you will, LA to Santa Barbara. Um, we got LA, then we have thousand Oaks, a lot of in between and then Santa Barbara and Ventura is one of those that those of us that know will stop in and there's some great little restaurants and cool little things but everyone else just blows right by it and it's like yeah just keep on going just keep going keep swimming uh but yeah it's a great area yeah ventura was voted by outside magazine as one of the top 10 places in the united states so was it really yes very cool awesome yeah but don't, um don't don't, don't yeah but don't come. and define perfect i mean or best places <laughs> to live you know it's a you know, Buffalo, I'm sure, is right up there, too. So <laughs> it's and it's a lot like Buffalo. So if you like Buffalo, you'll like Ventura. If not, don't go. I was, I was born and raised in Alloway from Buffalo. Wow. Michelle, in case you didn't hear, Michelle said she was born and raised an hour away from Buffalo. Wow. OK, we'll learn a lot. Um, did you have a other than in uh, in college, your sweet mate was a physical therapy major. Mm -hmm. You figured out, okay, I think that's what I want to do. Once you're in 
the world of physical therapy, whether it's in school or whether it was at the time of doing ATC and then going to PT school. At some point, uh, or even after school, did you have that moment of this is exactly what I was put on earth to do? Yes. Because one of the things that I like about physical therapy is that I can help someone with my hands right now. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing, you know, we need doctors and mm-hmm. they're gatekeepers and they, they need, you know, to see you and yep. diagnose correctly what the problem is. But I feel like a physician is um, a guide treatment. You come and you see the physician and say, okay, well, I'm going to write a prescription either for medication or to see someone else yep. to help you. Unless you're a physiatrist or a DO, then you can actually do some hands-on. Right. But the way um, it is set up, they don't have the time. You know, you only you see patients every 10 minutes. You don't have time to even do a treatment. So I feel like as a physical therapist, I can actually help someone. I can be traveling. I can be in, in the woods and someone has an issue. Yep. I can help them. Yep. Um, you know, if you have a headache or if you have something, you know, a doctor, well, I can just give you, give you a prescription. Right. And exactly. Then, then when you get to civilization, then you can. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's what, uh, attracted me to physical therapy that with my hands, I was be able to help someone. I like that. That's good. I have not heard that one. I like that. Great explanation of that. Um, do you work with. Um, today in the two clinics, do you work mostly with athletes or the everyday person or a combination? I work with extremes. I work with everything. Okay. I can see an Olympian mm-hmm. to a 94-year-old stroke patient. Okay. Or a, I went for three years, I did pediatrics. So I worked with uh, babies and oh, wow. working on developmentally, uh, de- developmental skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so I call myself a jack of all trades. I, I, I like to be able to help see as many diagnoses as possible. Right. So, um, from the, the jaw, TMJ, someone with vestibular issues, um, to neck, back, athlete. Um, the one area that I'm, I feel like I'm is women's issue and that's my, um, you know, the pelvic floor, mm-hmm. that's one area that I'm, I know nothing about. Okay. So that's, right. that's one area that I'm, I'm right right now considering, um, learning more about it. And I remember reading, you're also ART. Active release technique certified. So explain that for those that don't know. So active release techniques was developed by a, a, uh, engineer, mechanical engineer that became a chiropractor. Um, and about now 30 years ago and uh, active release is a way of it's a soft tissue technique where the uh, therapist or the uh, practitioner um, applies a pressure to a uh, to, to the muscle in a specific movement that is specific to that muscle and it's very effective um, and I learned about it about 10 years ago and uh, it has changed the way I treat hmm. I thought physical therapy was going to be that. When okay. I went to physical therapy school, yep. I thought what I learned in ART um, seminars was actually those were the tools I was going to learn in physical therapy right. school. And when I went through physical therapy school and I got out, I, I felt like something was missing. And, um, you know, I was treating patients, patients were getting better, but I felt like I, I didn't have the tools that I thought I was going to have until I um, learned about it and became certified in athletic in ART. Very cool. So ART, they, well, the one thing is very expensive. Um, seminars are usually body part, upper extremity, lower extremity, spine. Mm-hmm. It's four days, um, and they're about twenty five, twenty seven hundred dollars Wow. Uh, so it's very expensive. Yeah. But I felt like I was, I was going to change the way I treat it, and, I, and it did. It did. Because um, I know there's not that many ARTs around. So when I saw that um, on your bio, that, that kind of stood out. I mean, I know a few, but I don't think it's a, a common thing. Um, um, maybe it's becoming more. It's becoming more. I don't know. If, until recently, I was the only physical therapist in Ventura County. So okay. ART. Okay. Uh, there's two other chiropractors. Um, 
that are certified. Okay. ART in Canada um, is required really? to be certified in ART before you graduate from um, wow. chiropractic school. The gentleman that started ART, who's, what's his name? Michael Leahy. Okay. And uh, actually, um, he's the uh, chiropractor for the Denver Broncos. Oh, oh very cool. Uh, it's interesting because uh, at least he told us that um, since he's, he's been with the uh, Denver Broncos, the incident of meniscal injuries and surg- uh, surgically repairing or mm-hmm. uh, fixing the meniscus has decreased almost 80, 90 percent. Wow. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Um, as a physical therapist slash athletic trainer, what are some of the most um, common injuries you're getting with, and I'm going to direct it into exactly what I do um, as a personal trainer. So in those that are being physically active, uh, working out, um, is there a common thing you're seeing upon injury for those that exercise on a regular basis? Oh, I have a quote. Let me see if I can find it quickly. The reason why most people get injured. um, Can you relate it to one word? Because I could, but (laughs) they got me in trouble last time. (laughs) Doing too much too soon. Okay. (laughs) Which, oddly enough, goes right into the same one word that I'm thinking. But anyways. So that's pretty much... uh, what I see when it comes to individuals that go to the gym and start a new program, mm-hmm. uh, new runners that mm-hmm. want to, you know, train for a, uh, a race. Yep. Um, it's just doing too much too soon. Right. Okay. And then um, outside of that world, um, what are you seeing common injury in regards to teenage population? Teenage is uh, kids today. They they are. They persist, you know, if someone is in soccer mm-hmm. and they do club, and so they do that f- three or four times a day, a week, plus they do soccer for the, the high school. Mm-hmm. So they're training, you know, five days a week, and then they train year-round. Mm-hmm. They, they only have one, maybe two weeks off the entire year, and these wow. are, you know, 12, 13-year-old kids. Yep. So I always have to educate the parents. And I said, well, just, just look at the, uh, the professionals. Uh, just look at LA Galaxy mm-hmm. or the NBA or the NFL. Do they play year-round? Right. They don't. Right. They have a preseason. They have a season. They have an off-season. Yep. What makes you special <laughs> that you think you can go year-round right. with only two weeks off? Well, my kid is special, though. You haven't seen my kid play. <laughs> that's so, what the dad says <laughs> so it's pure pressure because yeah. all their all the other ones all, are doing it are doing it yeah is soccer the main sport of that that you see more than anything um soccer uh softball okay yeah oh yeah i would soccer definitely can see softball yeah um one of the things and i don't we see it well i shouldn't say we see it as, as personal trainers i love reading a lot of different um, medical journals that ones that I can understand that are at my pay grade. And, um, but one of the big areas of concern, and I have two daughters and I see it amongst their group. I see it amongst even some of the clients I, I train at the younger that are on their phones and the, um, they call it text neck and um, the positioning of the head staring at the phone, looking down at all times. Are you starting to see some of that stuff in the clinical setting? I see it, but I see it with everyone. Not only kids, but adults who are uh, glued to their iPads. I have a lady in her 70s with a tennis elbow Mm -hmm. from flipping the... uh, Wow. uh, Doing... uh, Yeah, swiping. Or not swiping, but yeah, the thread. Yes. Um, Wow. Or I see a lot of people with uh, issues with their shoulder, neck from holding mm-hmm. the phone and Instagramming or yep. Facebook, um, just holding the uh, the phone with their left hand. That's and, amazing. And also having issues with the numbness, tingling from looking down at the phone. Yep. So I see 
probably one every couple of weeks with those. That the phone is a major part of the uh, the problem. That's crazy. I was reading one um, one journal. It was a study that was done. It wasn't a study. It was a it was one of the journal magazines, and they showed a number of slides, X-rays, uh, to orthopedic spine specialists. And they had said, based off of this picture, what can you tell from it? And, you know, one after another, a car accident, car accident, whiplash, something of major trauma. And every one of them was uh, never had been in a trauma setting. And it was all from uh, phones. Um, and that's when they started noticing the neck issue. And that was one of um one of my clients who's a orthopedic spine specialist is the one that told me about this. And I was like, you got, that's crazy that it's that, that it can change that much. And I'm, I'm afraid what's going to happen because, uh, you know, at least in the, uh, in the workplace, you know, the, uh, the message is getting out there that, you know, sitting is a new smoking, right? And that you need to yep. stand, yep. you know, hope, you know, ideally you can stand about 70% of the time. Yep. And that's, you should, you know, um, shoot for that. Right. But when I, for kids, you know, there's no, no, there's no standards, you know, exactly. they, they're they playing video games or spending time on their phones, yep. you know, except by telling them just, you know, sit up straight. Yeah. Which, you know, exactly. at the time, you know, they don't, they don't see the consequences of why they, why should they? That's right. You know? Yeah. They're indestructible. I mean, so we like to see what's going to happen to them in, you know, 10 years. And right. What kind of issues are going to have? Yeah. Um, all right, take it a little different step. Do you, as a physical therapist, uh, do you get a lot, uh, or do you get any, none, a lot of personal trainers coming to you, um, whether it's referring uh, patients to you or on a, whether it be on the business side, referring patients or asking for clients, and or do you see any personal trainers bringing people in that, hey, I'm working with this person, something's going on, um, I need help as a personal trainer, like this is beyond my scope, do you, do you see that? No, I, I don't. Um, I've had, uh, clients have had injuries from, you know, working out. Right. Doing too much too soon. Yeah. But a trainer that calls me, and uh, no, I haven't. Okay. No. So for those trainers that are listening to this, um, let this be one of my many lessons I teach in my mentorship program that I, uh, that I have, and that is um, wherever you are in your area, work. I highly recommend working with a chiropractor, working with a physical therapist, not just one, but a, but a few. If you can get with a an MD as well, um, and the reason being, so, and Caleb and I were kind of talking a little bit about this at the beginning before we started the podcast, but so I'm certified through National Academy of Sports Medicine, NASM, and I've been with them since the they formed in '87 out of Chicago, and the first time they left. Chicago area to do certifications was at Loyola Marymount University out here in Southern California in 92. And I was part of that uh, graduating class. And back then, uh, we went through our certification course as a personal trainer. It was a uh, five day intensive, uh, 13 hour, 13, 14 hour days. And, but one of the days was, um, teaching us the business side of personal training and everything from these are the legal forms you need. This is how you um, answer the phone when a new client calls. If you're in a gym, this is how you walk up to somebody. I'm a new personal trainer. I went to a course and I'd love to show you something, everything, all the etiquette that comes with it. But part of that also was how to increase your business and how to start a business. And unfortunately, in NASM world and in many of the certification courses, they pulled that portion out of it. So being the, the business side. So you get a lot of trainers going through certification and they're like, great, I have this information, but I have no idea how to even get a client. Um, I don't even know if I know how to program, let alone if I can figure out the programming, I don't even know how to 
work with this client and where do I get clients and so forth. So one of the things that I learned from those days of NASM is a referral system uh, for one, but also knowing your limitation as a personal trainer and what you are not trained to do and what you are trained to do and what you're authorized to say and not say. So it was kind of a twofold. So NASM takes away the business side of teaching the business side. And then years later, uh, in 2000, a, an amazing physical therapist uh, by the name of Michael Clark. Uh, he was the uh, physical therapist for the Phoenix Suns uh, at the time. And just brilliant. And so he created um, a system called OPT for NASM. And I was there the day they presented it in 2000. And I'm looking at this and I, and I'm, I said to a buddy of mine, I used to work at hand, um, doing the hands-on portion of NASM for the advanced course. I, w- I mean, I was deep into the organization, just loved everything about it. I mean, it was, it was definitely a cult. Uh, there was no question, but you walked out of there and you felt confident to do your job on Monday. Um, and so as they're presenting it all, I looked to my buddy who was uh, director of education for NASM at the time. And I said, correct me if I'm wrong, but this to me is watered down physical therapy. And he kind of smiled and kind of chuckled. And he said, well, Michael Clark is a world renowned physical therapist. I said, that's great. Um, None of my clients are going to ask me about pronation distortion. They're not going to come to me and say, my ankle's rolling. Can you fix me? They don't even know their ankle's rolling. They don't even know when they squat that their knees cave in. And so now I'm learning how to see it, how to assess it, and how to fix it. And he's like, well, you're not fixing it. You're doing corrective exercises. I said, isn't that just another word for fixing it? And he's like, "Mm, kind of. And I said, but isn't there somebody out there that knows this better than me? He's like, yeah. I said, isn't that a physical therapist and a chiropractor? Yeah. I said, so now you guys have taken away the process of teaching me how to refer to clients, refer clients to professionals. You took that away from me. And now you're telling me that I'm qualified to do this assessment. I said, it's a double negative. Like you're you're shooting, I'm shooting myself in the foot here. I'm losing business and I'm possibly going to be stepping over the line of what I'm capable of doing in my eyes. And he said, well, you know, we don't see it this way. And I said, okay, that's great. I said, it's just not for me. So they've, and to this day, they continue down that path. And I, and I left, I, I still love NASM. I still love everything about it in the terms of when the trainer comes to me and they say, okay, I want to work with altering body composition clients. I want to specialize in losing body fat, increasing muscle. Where do I go? Because that's one of the things I try to help trainers. Like, hey, if I'm going to work with only athletes, you're going to NSCA, get your CSCS. That's where you want to be. Eventually, athletic training. That's your path. Boom. Don't even worry about everything else. You're not going to work with any athletes. You know, a few here and there. NASM. Uh, if you're going to work in the um, medical world, ACSM, um, doing clinical stuff. So, and, and they all have their places. But the first thing is you better learn how to refer to professionals. And, and that's why I kind of, it was a loaded question because I, I had a feeling I knew where it was going to go. And it, it blows me away how many trainers do not work with PTs, ATCs, chiropractors. They have no idea what to even say. And a lot of trainers that I've talked to, I don't know if they would fully admit it, but they just, they don't want to feel less than. I say, this is not about feeling less than. We deal with people from, um, as we kind of talked about, the physical therapist takes an injured, physical therapist, chiropractor takes an injured person, gets them feeling normal. We take them from normal to wherever we want to go. And if they have an injury, while we're training them or something that they do on their own, we take them back to the physical therapist, let them fix them, and then they come back to us and we take them back up. Yeah. Every PT that I've worked with, when I hand walk a client in, um, I say, something's going on here. I think I know what it is. 
And I may even point out, like when they're squatting, the knee keeps caving in, keeps diving in. Now I have a feeling I know what it is, but I want the PT to do the full assessment. Yep, good, good, you know, good eye, good call, or whatever. Now that client is in absolutely in love with me because I took the time to take him to this PT. The PT then every single time says, do you have business cards you can leave with me? Because I don't have any trainer that comes in here that offers up the service to bring people in here. And I mean, today, I um, literally just this morning, a woman was referred to me three years ago. It's taken her three years to, to finally call me. <laughs> and even the person that referred her um, is like, this is the guy. This is who you need to train with. And yeah, I'm sure, you know, she was eventually getting around to it. She calls me this morning. She's like, I'm literally leaving my PT. Do you know Tim? I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. And she said, I said, I'm thinking of hiring a PT. Do you know Mike Pincus? And he's like, wouldn't recommend anyone else. She says, and that's why I'm calling you. I'm like, done. Perfect. Hmm. So great referral initially, and the PT just secured it. And so I know, now I can call him and say, all right, you're seeing her. What's wrong? What's going on? What don't you want me to do? He literally will create the program for me. Say, don't do this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, are you okay with this, this, and this? He's like, absolutely. Have at it. Stay in touch with them. Perfect. So if that's why I love talking to PTs, and that's kind of mentioned it with Jonathan why you know we want to bring you in, is um, they don't see us. They don't see personal trainers, and I just don't get it. I know. I think there's a miss opportunity there completely yeah. yeah yeah i mean and not just the business side for both parties that that's an obvious one but literally from a learning side um it's funny uh do you know the uh name uh, gary gray mm-hmm. okay so i went to a, gary gray is a in in the personal training world we know gary gray is the man from a physical therapist side um and I was fortunate enough to go to one of his training seminars. Uh, it was a physical therapy seminar. Myself and one other guy were the only two PT, personal trainers in the room of 120 people. Hmm. I got about 10% of what that man said. And I'm sitting in the back of the room going, what am I doing here? And it was my buddy that said, you got to come. You're going to love this. You're going to love him. You're going to love his energy. And I'm like, this is great. So I'm there and... They're talking deep physical therapy stuff, and I'm like, my eyeballs are just rolling. I'm like, what? <laughs> but then something came up, and I'm like, wait a minute. I think I actually have an answer here. So I said to my buddy what they were talking about, and I said, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And, um, and he's an ATC. He's not a physical therapist, but he's an ATC slash personal trainer. He's like, yeah, say it. And what the conversation was is Gary's a big golfer. And they were talking about uh, repetitive motion and they were talking about golfers and what do you guys normally see in a golfer? And I'm like, okay, I'm a personal trainer. Most of my clients either play golf or tennis. They think they're professionals, but they're not. And um, he's like, what are the common injuries and what do you guys do about it? And this and that. And everyone is breaking down the golf swing segment by segment. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, so I raised my hand and I said, this uh, case study you gave us. I said, did the golfer have back issues before he started golfing? And, and you can see Gary smile. And he said, no. I said, so the golf swing created the problem. He said, yeah. And I said, does this, he's a right-handed golfer? Yeah. I said, well, if he's golfing anything the way I golf, that's 180 swings in one direction. Couldn't you just put a different head on, a lefty head, and shorten up the club and swing 180 times the other way when you're done golfing? He's like, yeah, you could. And that will unwind everything. He's like, where do you practice? I'm like, I'm a personal trainer. And then the whole room turns and I'm like, and afterwards I was fortunate enough to have dinner with him. He's sitting across the table from me. His family's there. The best of the best. Uh, Michael Clark's there. Uh, Juan Carlos Santana's at this table. I mean, it was the heads of state. It was the coolest thing. And he looks at me, he's like, so what's your story? I'm looking around, I'm like, who, me? And I, I said, I'm just a personal trainer. And he stopped me in my tracks. He says, don't ever say that. He's like, you're a personal trainer, and go on. I said, yeah, but I'm not a physical therapist. And he's like, and why didn't you go into physical therapy? And I kind of explained my thoughts as I was telling you earlier. And 
he said, let me ask you something. Who do you think, and at this point, this was the exact time when NASM was making the change. And he says, who do you think should be running personal training program? A physical therapist or a personal trainer? I'm like, okay, this is a loaded question because you're a PT, personal, a physical therapist. So I'm going to go on a limb here and say, I think a personal trainer. And he's like, you're right. And he said, why? And I said, no, and I go back to it again. I said, no one comes to me and says I have pronation distortion. And he looked at me and he says, no one asks me about eating avocados. I'm like, wow. So right there, and, and this was 2001, 2002. It was crazy. Um, so that's why I brought it up and was wondering. So trainer's lesson to be learned is when you're done hearing this, please go introduce yourself to a physical therapist, chiropractor, anybody that has more education than us. Um, yeah, I think physical therapists, we do a good job about breaking down a movement to the most basic uh, yeah. movement. And then we build it from, from that point on. Yep. But then once the person can do you know, functional stuff and they want to go beyond that, then they're usually done with therapy. Insurance won't cover beyond that point. And that's when the uh, personal trainer comes yep. in. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Now, at your clinic, um, either one in Ventura Camarillo, do you guys have... Once you've taken them to, I'm going to air quotes here, the normal level, um, do you have aids in there that are able to continue working with them to make sure the pattern is working correctly? Um, or is it once once insurance is over, then they're escorted out? Oh. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> get out. Well, in our clinic in Ventura, they have the option of, signing up for a wellness program mm -hmm. so then they can continue perfect uh, what we have established their program yep. and then with the guidance of an athletic trainer yep they continue perfect they, they want to yeah yep so and insurance have, doesn't cover that correct no okay so lesson to be learned there personal trainers that are listening to this there are some and that and i think that's fairly common um or i like to say is the hopefully i don't offend any of my listeners here, but uh, all my good PTs that I work with in Kairos have that ability, that, that wellness program where the uh, patient can pay out of pocket and continue to be guided in, um, with correct form and so forth before they're released into the wild. I know there's a place in Camarillo, George Herb. I don't know if you've heard of him. Mm -mm. Um, he spent in practice for a long time. He, he used to have a, a pool. They, he they, he closed the pool and he built a gym. Oh wow! So, so he sells gym memberships. Okay. But I think also he uses that as a transitional perfect for patients to yep. after they're done with physical therapy, they can then continue yep. and work at the gym. So. Perfect. And again, for the trainers listening, you will run into the physical therapist says, "Well, we have you know, you go in, you introduce yourself as a as a personal trainer." I'm here to take over when insurance is up and the physical therapist may say, well, we have that covered. We have a wellness program here. And I run into that a lot. And I'd simply tell them if your patient does not want to continue to come here, I go to their home or they come to my facility or whatever. And occasionally it does happen and they, okay, great. Perfect. And we'll give your, keep your cards and refer you out. So, um, I think it's a, it's a great thing to offer. Um, both sides. So that. now what I do is, you know, since I don't have a trainer that I can refer to, um, so if someone has a gym membership, I tell them, okay, tell me what you, what kind of equipment you have. And then I say, take pictures or yep. video and then come here and we'll talk about, you know, what you should do, what kind Perfect. of machines you should avoid or exercises you should avoid. And for your condition, these are the type of exercises you should concentrate on. Awesome. So. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, all right, so we're going to um, take you down some, let's see. Uh, these are just some fun questions that I like to ask people. Um, what other profession could you see yourself doing if you were not a physical therapist? Um, hmm. If I, I'm 5'8". So it would have been six four. I told everyone you were six seven. <laughs> <laughs> if you were six four, I probably would have 
pursue professional volleyball. Really? Yeah. That's okay. Do you still play volleyball now? Not as much as I want to. Okay. <laughs> um, I would have hopefully been a professional athlete. At 5'8", you could be a libero. Yeah. Libero? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's see. What, hob- what are your hobbies now? Right now, uh, I'm taking a break from running. Um, I would too. <laughs> <laughs> well, my uh, so I do I do a little bit of cycling, mountain biking, running, um, kayaking. Okay. Um, but my next uh, venture is I want to run a ultra, one hundred miles. Oh, nice! So I'm taking wow. a, I'm taking a mental and physical and spiritual break. Yeah. Because I know what it takes to train for something like that. So I'm taking a break so I can, you know, fully commit. Sure. Yeah. Have you been introduced to the world of Rich Roll? Rich yeah. Roll is an ultra, uh, ultra, ultraman, right? Um, Rich rides a Franco, uh, greatest bikes of all time. Um, I have one, I'm my second. And uh, Rich is, Rich at the age of, God, I hope I don't screw this up, but Rich at the age of 46 was facing just done. In terms of health, Um, he was a successful attorney and was having a hard time climbing up the stairs with his daughter, I think, on his on his back. And at the age of 50, before he turned 50, became one of the 25 fittest humans in the world. And he did. uh, There's a book called Finding Ultra. And if you are in that break right now of running, don't start it until you're ready to come back. Because you'll start it, you won't put it down, and you'll start running, whether you are ready or not. I'm not a runner. And you put that down, and you're like, yeah, I'm running today. (laughs) It's it's an unbelievable read. Um, And it just talks about his path of destruction, uh, self-destruction himself, and then how he came out of it. And when you think he's at rock bottom, he's not there yet. Just keep that in mind. And he... um, he lives out here locally um, and rides out here locally, and um, he's a plant-based um, hmm. athlete, and he's now 52, and he's, um, at 51, I think he kind of slowed down a little bit, but at 52, he's kicking it back up, but he did uh, five Ironmans in five days on five islands in Hawaii. Oh, wow. um, not to pimp the story, but it took him seven days instead of five days. The plan was to do five <laughs> days, but you, you do need to read it. It's in that book. Yeah. Um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Great, great, great story. Um, what's a perfect day for you? Wake up and just what's the perfect day, the way you want to spend it? Uh, get to do anything. Yeah. Perfect day would be uh, get up around nine, have breakfast, Get on my helicopter and... Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. No, uh, just uh, Ventura weather. I mean, okay. Ventura yep. is close to paradise. Yep. Um, perfect day would be that. Go on a hike and do something active um, with friend or family, friends and family, and enjoy the outdoors. That would be the perfect day. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Um... Favorite color? It used to be green. Uh, now it's red. Okay. Interesting. Favorite sound? The uh, coqui, which is a uh, frog from Puerto Rico. Hmm. Yeah. <whistles> so when I hear that, I know I'm home. Very yeah. cool. Least favorite sound? Traffic. I thought you were going to say your nephew's voice. <laughs> <laughs> favorite food? Um, Mexican. What's that? It's a combination of Mexican food and Puerto Rican food. Oh. Like enchiladas with plantains. Okay. And, yeah. Fun fact. Random fun fact. Went to Trader Joe's today trying to find food that I can eat. My diet's changed a bit and came across plantain chips. Mm. And I don't know why I like plantain anything 
because I wasn't raised with it, bought them, damn good. <laughs> so kind of funny that you brought that up. Uh, least favorite food? Um, too spicy. I like spicy food, but not too spicy. Okay. Favorite music? Favorite music. Um, depends on the mood. Depends I from okay. tropical to like t- today. I have patience and I have Pandora. So depending on the patient, their age, yep. I select music that is specific for them. Right. So the ninety year olds are not listening to EDM. No, so I put Frank Sinatra for them. Oh, perfect. So, yeah, yeah that get them in the mood. <laughs> um, who would you like to have dinner with, dead or alive? Right now, I would like to have a dinner with. Eliu Kipchoge, the guy that just broke the two-hour marathon record. Yeah, I just saw that. So we'd um, love to have dinner with him. Who posted that? A friend of mine posted that. That's crazy. Like that's a that no, is. I nuts. watched the live. You just, did. Yes. Wow. Um, what do you want to be known for? What's on your tombstone? Um. I definitely want to be missed. That's good. Like people feel like their day is empty because I'm gone. If you had a <laughs> Jewish mother, that would be every day. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Every day you don't call her. <laughs> That's what it would be like. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> That'll get me in trouble. Uh, Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thanks Um, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks, John from Michelle, for setting this up. And I want to uh, really emphasize to trainers listening out there to really uh, think long and hard about uh, who you're working with, uh, who's your inner circle, and who you do business with. And more than anything, as a personal trainer, knowing our limitations and um, referring out. Um, it's, it's the easiest and fastest way to grow your business, not just from a financial reward, um, but a uh, feel-good reward system where the PT looks at you differently. Your client will completely change the way they look at you, and you then really have their back. So I think it's a, it's a huge thing. So I thank you as a, as a personal trainer to a physical therapist. I thank you for doing what you guys do and allowing us just to focus on what we do. Um, well, and thank you for what you yeah, do. Yeah. Till next time, guys. I uh, hope you guys have a great week, and we will talk to you soon. I'm putting on tiny little bathing suit and putting diaderm on and getting up on stage and having seven people judge me. That never came out of their mouth.